Доброго дня, шановні гості, спікери. Good afternoon, dear guests, dear speakers, and those who watch us online. And I'm happy to announce the uh, opening of a big press conference devoted to Ukraine's anti-corruption theory of change. No, dear ladies and gentlemen, I would like to present to you a memo which we prepared in Antak. Uh, its name is uh, Ukraine's Anti-Corruption Theory of Change, Recipe for Success and Lessons Learned for the Window of Opportunity. Those of you who registered for our broadcasting can um, receive this text on your email. The others can go online on the website of NTAC, ntac.org.ua slash n, and find it there. Um, in 2013-2014, the historic window of opportunities opened in Kyiv. To a large extent, our anti-corruption fight was uh, inspired by the examples of Georgia and Romania. Since then, new anti-corruption tools, instruments and approaches were tested out in Ukraine. Over almost eight years, Ukraine accumulated precious experience which we have summarized in our memo. This is the perspective of reforms insiders. We want this memo to be a collection of very practical ideas. It might be useful for the leaders from the transitional democracies who would like to prepare for the window of opportunities in their countries. Uh, we would also like it to be useful for the international partners while planning their activities in the countries which face similar challenges as Ukraine does. And Tuck believes that effective anti-corruption is a fundamental prerequisite for the successful transition from the autocracy to democracy. The successful anti-corruption strategy should be based on the significant elevation of risks for corrupt actors. Uh, but who could do this and how this can be achieved? Uh, in our memo, we elaborated uh, our anti-corruption um, theory of change. Uh, you can see it on the infographics uh, now. It is based on three pillars, uh, the drivers of the reform and two reform deliverables, overwhelming transparency, that's basis for corruption prevention, and effective system for criminal justice. This infographics is a part of our memo, so you can find it here to look at it uh, with more details. Drivers of the anti-corruption reform include civil society organizations, investigative journalists. It is worth separately mentioning the ability of the civil society actors and journalists to unite in the coalitions. Also international partners and reformers inside the government play an important role in driving anti-corruption reform forward. Civil society activists and investigative journalists are key assets and driving forces of the real democratization in any country. They should prepare for the window of opportunity, but they can already achieve a significant result, meaningful results, even under the autocratic rule. For example, uh, during the presidency of Viktor Yanukovych, Ukrainian civil society organizations and journalists achieved following results. Small victories, which later paved the, the way for the large scale transformations, like, for example, the adoption of the law uh, on the access to public information. Um, also, they developed workings, which um, despite have been lying on the shelves without any move for years, were put on the table immediately after Yanukovych fled the country and pro-Russian um, coalition dissolved in the parliament. Also, journalists were shedding uh, the light on the kleptocratic corrupt schemes, uh, while civil society organizations were collecting information about kleptocrats' foreign assets, which later helped to uh, introduce the sanctions of the Western countries against 
uh, Yanukovych and his close allies. Activists and journalists are doing really dangerous work. Therefore, it is very important besides keeping investing in their advocacy, communications, fundraising capacities and potential uh, to also provide them with the political support for their brave activities as well as necessary protection. Synergetic cooperation of CSOs and international partners is uh, instrumental. Uh, CSOs are more vocal and less bounded in their public communications. Usually they have a very good understanding of the local political context and are more quickly and easier um, following the devil in details. International partners have good political capital, expertise and strong advocacy leverage, including the financial assistance. Therefore, we believe that such financial assistance uh, and other type of international assistance uh, should be conditioned on the set of strong uh, conditionalities, reform deliverables. In the case of Ukraine, visa liberalization action plan uh, and IMF memorandums proved to be miracle makers in pushing the reforms forward. Another pillar of Ukraine's anti-corruption theory of change is transparency. You can also see this on the infographics. Uh, opening up state-controlled information about who owns what and how state funds are being used is a very helpful tool for the civil society and investigative journalists to name and shame corrupt officials. In Ukraine, these transparency tools are registries like company registry, vehicles registry, land cadaster or real estate registries, Prozoro public procurement system, website for the use of public funds. However, the most important and the most comprehensive tool is electronic asset declaration system. Such a system could be effective only in case if it includes both public registry with a very detailed data that concerns a public official as well as their family members and strict working sanctions for non-submission of the declaration, false statements in the declaration and illicit enrichment. Uh, the cases into investigations of these violations should fall under the jurisdiction of the truly independent uh, agencies. In case of Ukraine, that's National Anti-Corruption Bureau, to ensure that public servants are afraid of potentially strict punishment. Such a holistic system is itself a very powerful preventive measure tool. Public officials are, are aware that once they lie in the declaration or their lifestyle does not correspond with the officially declared income, uh, there is a high likelihood that they will be brought to liability in case of illicit enrichment, um, which uh, exceeds a special um, threshold, um, they could uh, even face prison. The variety of transparency tools uh, in their turn could boost new civil society and private driven initiatives. Like for example, the um, first ever national registry of politically exposed persons. Um, it was launched by NTAC and it is grounded on the information from this um, registries and electronic declaration system that I mentioned. Um, its aim, the aim of this registry is to facilitate fighting against money laundering by providing financial institutions with credible information for their due diligence over the financial transactions of Ukrainian public figures. The third pillar, also shown on the infographic, is establishment of independent anti-corruption and judicial institutions. Uh, I think that we can turn off the infographic already. And such a move might be effective way to go um, in the countries where large scale reforming of the law enforcement, prosecution and judiciary um, would take much longer time uh, and is not uh, guaranteed, is not secured. <clears throat> um, after Maidan, Ukraine has built um, a range of new anti-corruption institutions like National Anti-Corruption Bureau, Specialized Anti-Corruption Prosecutor's Office, High Anti-Corruption Court, Asset 
Credit uh, Management and Recovery Agency, as well as National um, Agency for Corruption Prevention. Um, the new institutions um, of, of the criminal justice, NABU SAPO and Anti-Corruption Court, are already bringing high-profile uh, officials to liability. These institutions would be effective only if there are necessary independent safeguards in place. Um, the selection of the management is a cornerstone issue. Ukrainian experience uncovered a huge, important and effective potential of the engagement of international partners in the selection panels if they are granted with the right of the uh, crucial say in the process. Um, such a crucial role of foreign experts proved to be a real game changer. And the best illustration for that was the um, experience of the um, high anti-corruption court. Uh, international um, and civil society uh, engagement without the crucial role will eventually be used as the window dressing for the whole process. Um, unfortunately, we have um, not a positive experience of the Supreme Court establishment, where the Public Integrity Council did enormously huge job in scrutinizing all of the candidates who ran to the Supreme Court. But because their opinions uh, were not binding, they were overruled by the judicial governance bodies uh, and eventually did not have the proper impact on the whole process of the selections. Um, in fact, the successful establishment of new institutions require the engagement of the reform actors throughout the whole process, well beyond the advocacy of the legislation only. It requires active engagement in the process of the recruitment of the candidates who could run um, for the top managerial, but also to the mid-level offices as well. Uh, it requires engagement in the institutional building, uh, protection from undue political influence um, and political pressure, watchdogging of the activities uh, over the um, watchdogging over the activities uh, of these um, new bodies, as well as constructive criticism for their work, is also instrumental. Uh, Ukraine's experience proves that countries uh, where corruption is deeply rooted, uh, it's almost impossible to uh, fight against corruption with the internal resources only. So for other countries which might be willing to introduce the experience of Ukraine with foreign engagement um, in the selection of the management of the new institutions, and Tuck recommends for the international community to consider establishing the pool um, of the international experts who might be interested to get engaged in the similar commissions uh, in other countries too, uh, and uh, to, to pick people um, from that list in case if, um, if the countries would introduce similar experience and um, secure the a crucial role for the foreign experts um, in the selection panels. Uh, however, the reflections will not be balanced without the part on lessons learned. Um, so what's the most important um, lessons which we drew from our eight-year fight against corruption? The first one, any window of opportunity should be used uh, to launch the reform of the judiciary. Uh, Non-reformed courts are the real threat to any uh, healthy initiative and any reform in any sector and in any sphere. Um, in Ukraine, we came to understand that judicial reform should start from reforming judicial governance bodies, basically the judges for judges. Uh, and then the reform of the constitutional court should also follow. Transitional democracies require flexible approaches and bold innovative solutions established European standards of, um, uh, um, of the majority of judges taking part in the judicial governance bodies um, would not work in case if the system is not um, cleaned. Um, before it. Um, together with other civil society organizations from Ukraine, Armenia, Bulgaria, Moldova and Romania, we developed a set of the recommendations which were presented during this year Democracy in Action conference. 
And what we recommend, that judicial governance bodies should be reformed, taking into account political and historical co context of each particular country. Uh, it's important to engage independent outsiders uh, in the process of the reforming. In case of Ukraine, there was international partners. If there is the real political will, there, should also, there could also be the civil society experts, but also, uh, only in case if um, they are having the, the, the same crucial role as I already mentioned. Um, or it is also important to arrange integrity scrutiny for all those people who are running to take the offices in the judicial governance bodies. Disinformation could be also a real threat to... Um, disinformation could be also a real threat to democracy, especially if it targets reforms and reformers, including the Western partners. This has been happening in Ukraine for a while. This requires a very proactive communication um, from the side of the reformers, um, well beyond the bubble of the experts or the um, politically active minority. It is very important to reach out to the wider audience and it could be done via the most effective communications channels. In case of Ukraine, that's uh, television. Um, the owners of the most popular TV channels are oligarchs who are actively doing business with the West. Um, that is why it is logical to demand from them that their channels are not attacking the reforms. And on the contrary, they are happy helping to disseminate the positive messages um, about the reforms. Communicative reform killing should be treated with all due seriousness by the international partners and should also be the subject to sanctioning. Foreign investors and international institutions should feel the pressure to stop doing business with oligarchs whose media attack democracy and reforms. Thank you very much for listening to this overview of our memo. We welcome you to look through the entire text and back, get back to us with your feedback or questions. Please stay tuned uh, as very shortly we will follow with we will follow with the discussion on um, what's next and what should be the way forward for the anti-corruption reform. Thank you. Доброго вечора. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. During previous session, I presented a memo prepared by Anti-Corruption Action Center, and this was dedicated to Ukraine's anti-corruption theory of change, and we've described seven years 
of uh, fight of uh, investigative journalists and national part um, partners uh, who fought for the biggest uh, democracy achievements in the sphere of uh, development of uh, anti-corruption institutions. We should speak not only about difficulties we face each day, but also we should recognize the pro progress. Uh, and this panel now is dedicated to discussions how to move forward ahead in order to preserve our achievements and to interact better and what should be the main focus for us in order that in five years the societal request for fighting corruption and for justice was satisfied. So I have the honor to present our today's speakers. Yaroslav Yurchishin, member of parliament of Ukraine, first deputy chairman of the anti-corruption uh, policy Committee, Artem Romanyukov, co-founder of the Save Dnipro Initiative. Online. Alexandra Gubitska, editor of Nashi Groshi Lviv, and Frank Paul, uh, governance and rule of law, digital team leader at the su um, support group for Ukraine European Commission. We give the floor to Yaroslav Yurchishin. He is the former head of uh, Transparency International Ukraine. And uh, now you have uh, versatile experience in advocacy of uh, anti-corruption reform. And you know about many drivers of changes. What should be done in order to preserve our achievements and to continue to support this impulse of reform? reforms momentum. The first and the most important reforms, they are not the state, they are a process. That's why we should provide institutional support to anti-corruption bureau and uh, um, uh, national agency for preventing corruption and to help anti-corruption prosecutors office and the agency that deals with confiscated assets about the first one about uh, specialized prosecutors office there was a contest and uh, we promised uh, to our international partners to deal with it properly uh, there should be two aspects dealt with. We should provide legislation for independence of this contest and uh, the unique recipe for anti-corruption action is a proper independent selection process of the management of this institution and also um, constitutional court and other bodies, they should uh, deal with these issues properly, and our international experts should be uh, heard. And uh, also, um, there is a lack of uh, a proper office uh, of SAPO and uh, General Prosecutor's uh, Office. This is 100%. Uh, uh, these people are not uh, independent and we should improve legislation for ARMA at the stage of planning and at the stage of management of confiscated assets. We need proper cooperation with our international partners. And uh, now we are at the stage when institutional support, and here I should remember organizations of civil society, if we have an official new body, but if it doesn't have proper system of monitoring uh, from the side of um, uh, civil society organizations, uh, then uh, its independence won't be guaranteed. So we should have proper cooperation with civil society, with uh, councils, uh, public councils of uh, monitoring. There should be uh, the Zorro network involved there should be proper efficiency and uh, uh, we should have proper involvement of civil society in the process. Now we are at the stage where we have this momentum of reform. 
and we should send this uh, uh, impulse to other areas. Uh, we should uh, provide proper reforms to courts and uh, also uh, the members, the officials uh, who should be reassessed and uh, uh, the head of SBU, they, uh, he has such an opportunity. He, uh, they may prevent uh, access to state uh, secret, uh, and there will be imitation of reform, and the result will be like in the State Investigation Bureau. Uh, state Investigation Bureau, we remember uh, that it was a great struggle to bring this bureau in line to the Constitution of Ukraine and to provide the proper responsibilities to the Ministry of uh, uh, Cabinet of Ministers to provide proper procedures. And uh, also, uh, uh, these uh, structures, they became uh, politicized. And uh, Yuri Butusov's case, you may assess it differently how the questions were asked, but you should not uh, prosecute president after uh, one uh, question. This is not correct. Uh, so uh, State Investigation Bureau needs reform, and uh, also State uh, Investigation Bureau, they should uh, work properly. Now we do not have proper activity of, the, of this body. And about uh, courts, uh, Alana mentioned it in the introductory word. So we should reform courts to get rid of unfair judges. We should rebuild trust to courts. And uh, citizens uh, should be able to file the cases to the courts without any problems. So uh, people do not like to address courts uh, uh, at the moment. So now also important issue is uh, fighting oligarchs and um, we do not use mechanisms properly. Anti-monopoly committee of Ukraine or law enforcement system and profile ministry and regulatory commission in the sphere of energy and in the sphere of media. Why we do not use these mechanisms? Because they are inefficient. They do not work in the interests of the market. The procedure of formation of anti-monopoly committee does not envisage independent contest. That's why traditionally the there are people close to power, and they are close to oligarch circles, and also, so our oligarchs build these monopolies, and we cannot expect that these people would fight monopolies. We focus on the questions that are ahead of us. So we are going to speak about anti-corruption bureau and the electronic system of declaration, and other bodies, they need institutional support at the legislative and organizational level. And the responsibilities of the national anti-corruption, uh, of national agency of uh, corruption prevention, uh, they uh, should be reinforced and they should follow proper procedures. But we have good examples of work of some institutions new approaches of uh, formation of institutions, new transparent contests, uh, higher levels of salary, good management, uh, and uh, proper premiums and uh, payments that are transparent. And NEBO uh, and SBU, they differ very much in this respect. Also, uh, they have partners in private uh, sector uh, in the uh, uh, public sector, they provide proper assessment and provide proper advice on the development. And we see that uh, uh, we should work in different areas and we should uh, do it quickly. This is for two and a half years. We should change political configuration by small steps. We should squeeze out corruption from 
courts, from judiciary, security. Uh, we should have proper anti-monopoly legislation, and step by step, we should form zero tolerance to corruption in other bodies of power. Thank you. Thank you, Yaroslav. This was a really comprehensive answer. This was a helicopter view. And at the same time, this was a cross-sectoral approach. Artem, I have a question to you. A civil society played a major role and continues the, its major, to play its major role in reforms. But uh, we have a lot of plans, but many reforms that they are implemented in Kiev, uh, not throughout Ukraine. So locally, people do not feel that there is this fight against corruption. Not always people have such a feeling. And uh, uh, what about the situation in the regions and what should be the priorities in fighting corruption in order to feel this justice locally, to be closer to people? Thank you for your question. I will start my answer with bad news in order to go to the better news at the end of my speech. The law enforcement system in the regions is inactive, inefficient. Unfortunately, we are people who are involved in the activities at the regional levels. Uh, I wanted to bring the case, I, but I couldn't find the real serious case at the mid-level, at the local level. Uh, I couldn't find the case of an official who would be brought to justice for corruption. So we do not have good news on this. But I would like to broaden this topic. We have some local cases, usually. This is the contribution of national bodies that were created due to reform. If you take a DESA case, we have high-profile official, the mayor of the city, together with his allies, I cannot say how we may call them legally, but this was uh, the case of National Anti-Corruption Bureau. Also, Kiev is one of the regional cases. Here all reforms are done, but the corruption that is flourishing in the sphere of development, this is under the radar because uh, uh, there are no players who may deal with it efficiently in law enforcement area. And at the regional level, we have some good things that allow our civil society to work efficiently. This is access to open data, to registers, and it was mentioned before. And uh, it allows monitoring, and they may bring this information to, a, to the broader public. There are registers, the system of public procurement that is called Prozoro. So due to the system, now we are able to see many things, but uh, there is lack of uh, proper environment around Prozoro. So we open the procurement, but state audit service remains unreformed. Key actors who should provide controlling function in procurement, they are the same. They didn't change. Also, I would like to say that we have decentralization that provided budgets at the local level, but uh, with this decentralization of budgets, corruption was also decentralized. 
If you are a local corrupt official, in many cases, you do not need to fight for the position at the cabinet of ministers or to go to the parliament. Budgets in the big cities, they are uh, big enough. So they may stay at a local level and to have the same corrupt profits as they had before at the national level. So this is about lack of control at the regional level and the lack of efficiency of law enforcement bodies. So we are working uh, together, and uh, this is about environment, uh, environmental and anti-corruption issues. And I would like to say that in 2017, the law entered into force that allows the public to take um, decisions in uh, environment issues. This is uh, about the environment impact assessment. The key player, the main controller in this area, the state environmental inspection, that should have had some serious leverage to deal with the corruption in the environment sector. It remains the most corrupt from all the controlling bodies and inspections in Ukraine. That's why we uncovered a lot of things for a local level. This is really good instrument to inform people on, corrupt, on corruption, on crimes, but we lack some cross-sectoral approach in law enforcement because we have corruption everywhere, not only in one area. We need cross-sectoral approach to eradicate corruption in different areas because this is not only about NABU, this is about other bodies. So I remember that in 2016 I heard from my colleague, this was Daria Kalinyuk, uh, one sentence, uh, what reform is. Uh, Ukraine is the most transparent corrupt country. So we really have this transparency, but there is no proper responsibility after corruption is uncovered. So we uh, have the question to Alexandra now. Je investigative journalists, even in times of Yanukovych's presidency, were capable to find a lot of information. They carried out resonance investigations, even when there was lack of access to information. Now we have transparency that was mentioned by me and my colleagues. So you have much more work than before. So I have a provocative question to you. What should be done in the next five years in order that the investigative journalists had less work, not more? First of all, I want to say that uh, uh, very soon the uh, uh, journalists will get less and less work. I think that's not true. They will get more and more work to do. Even even if law enforcement system in Ukraine worked uh, much, much better. Even in this case, uh, we were to have uh, some work to do, but that's not the case now. And Ukraine still drastically lacks this feeling that the punishment is inevitable. And that's why the offenders, they keep making their offenses once and once again. Uh, this means actually that investigative journalists and uh, honest journalists, professional journalists, uh, should uh, strengthen their work and continue their investigations because due to the corrupt media, to the media which are um, owned by the 
oligarchs, a Ukrainian public at large, do not get the true information about the situation with corruption. I would like to emphasize that during the last uh, several years uh, in the regions we witnessed uh, the appearance and uh, effective functioning of some anti-corruption uh, NGOs, but these NGOs, they require financial sustainability for their development, for retainment of professional experts, and this means that with the growth in assets uh, for which in course of decentralization go uh, to the regions of Ukraine, uh, much corruption is uh, uh, moving to the regional level. That's why that strong anti-corruption uh, NGOs in the regions uh, become of primarily importance. That's why I believe that one of our priority is to build up and to support the development and sustainability of such anti-corruption NGOs in the regions. Uh, another big uh, precondition for transparency are, of course, open data, because the lack of open data um, uh, entails the lack of transparency, the lack of accountability, because uh, uh, broad public like journalists and investigative journalists cannot get access to the data if they are in hard copies. Also, I would like to point out to some uh, budget uh, managers like forestries, for example, they do not recognize that they are subject to the law about public procurement. They do not present how and publish how do they spend their budgets. And uh, this creates non-transparency while society needs to know whether there are any violations and abuses in this area. At the same time, the timber market in Ukraine remains, remains one of the most uh, uh, hidden and most closest markets in this country. And uh, while this is a multi-billion market, and that's why we should request for its opening for the broad public and for um, Ukrainian and uh, uh, foreign businessmen. And once again, I would like to emphasize the importance of uh, open data and of the digital co uh, communication in digital uh, documents, because when there are uh, bulks of papers, they could easily burn, they can easily disappear, uh, while for transparency, you need all the information and communication to be uh, stored somewhere, better in digital format. Thank you, Alexandra. I would like to apologize for the specificity for this consecutive translation. This is the result of uh, uh, technical details for connection in Zoom. <laughs> and now my question to Frank. In post-Maidan Ukraine, uh, the international partners are justly seen as uh, uh, one of the most efficient drivers of uh, reforms, and uh, the European Union is uh, truly seen as uh, the um, key player here. How do you see the key role of the um, European Union in supporting anti-corruption work in Ukraine for the next five years? and? what are the uh, specificities of the EU attitude to Ukraine after the latest uh, uh, report of the audit chamber, chamber recently, some months ago? Thank you very much for, for having invited me. And uh, for this question now, first of all, it's obviously 
easy for me to speak as one of the last speakers because uh, I, I can only agree with almost 100% with what everybody else said. I think Alexandra Witzka has uh, hit the nail on the head when she said a very simple truth that goes beyond any theory of change. You can uh, indeed develop a lot of paper-based theories and about how you would change the situation and how you would have less corruption, etc. But the basic truth remains. Why is it so that in the European Union, I'm speaking of countries, for instance, Denmark, Germany, um, Spain, Portugal, why is there less corruption in Ukraine? I'm not saying that there is no corruption, but why is there significantly less corruption? It is definitely not because people there are morally better or because they're less prone to being seduced by uh, by uh, uh, earning more money on the side. No, not at all. It is because they live in fear and terror. <laughs> Every official knows that if he gets caught being corrupt, if he gets caught, and that's not only officials, everybody, everybody knows that if he or she is being caught being corrupt, he or she will go to prison. Absolutely no exception. There's no way you can work, buy your way out. You will go to prison. And what's worse, uh, probably you will not only go to prison, but you will also be socially stigmatized when you get out, which is sometimes a worse punishment for people than actually going a couple of years to prison. And that is really the key. Um, being able to really make no exception to have a policy of zero tolerance that basically installs fear in people. That's the basic truth. And I think there's still some way to go in Ukraine. Now, how do we get there? And um, what do we think as the European Union is, is important here? First of all, it's already been said, so I'll be short on this, sustaining the independence and effectiveness of all the anti-corruption institutional infrastructure. Now, it has been successfully established, but as you all know, it's a daily fight to keep them uh, on the right path to make sure that they continue to be independent uh, and very important also that the delineation of competences remains clear. As soon as this becomes blurred, it's going to be a nightmare and uh, the next possibility where such delineation of competences might be a problem is when hopefully um, the uh, large-scale smuggling of commodities will be criminalized in Ukraine. That's a key element to close the, the space for corruption. And once that happens, the key question will be which bodies will be in a position to investigate cases of large-scale smuggling and the surrounding corruption. And here it must be absolutely crystal clear who does it and who has the competence. Then, um, also, when it comes to the recruitment of management and the senior staff, it is very important, obviously, that they maintain high-level integrity. And I think the path that Ukraine has wisely chosen, meaning that for a limited transitional period, you ask international donors to be uh, also um, involved in this process, is a very wise um, decision. Um, and I think that has helped to make sure that there is less internal influence of vested interests on the bodies that uh, are supposed to select and recruit uh, this senior staff. But then it's not only about, um, obviously, um, you know, going after the symptoms of corruption, but it's also equally important, if not more important, to go after the underlying causes. That is, you need to have a stronger focus on prevention of uh, corruption, and that again is about reducing the space for it in key sectors. And um, indeed, this means that, um, sorry, I, there are some incoming calls. Um, it means indeed that these key sectors must be, for instance, in competition, we need to strengthen competition and state aid control system to prevent high level corruption and reduce the oligarchic influence in concentrated markets. That is very important. It has already been, to some extent, successful, for instance, in the energy sector. 
But here also, there's still a lot to be done. I think uh, the mandate and the capacities um, and also the professionalism and integrity of the energy regulator still has room for improvement. Um, when it comes to legislation, I think what's very important, not yet really done, is a systematic anti-corruption check of draft laws. Um, and I think we need people there who really have a lot of experience, people in a way with a certain criminal mind, but who are still on the good side, who could basically place themselves in the shoes of a criminal and see, okay, how could I, could I use this draft law for my purposes? How could I develop a draft scheme, uh, a corrupt scheme around this? And then systematically try to avoid um, the pitfalls of these draft laws. Then also um, implementation of the law on administrative procedure. That uh, law has just been adopted in second reading. We really hope it'll be signed into force by the president uh, very quickly, uh, because that law is really a quite revolution. It will bring about more accountability of civil servants, but more importantly, it will bring about a lot of transparency. And transparency is really key to closing the space for corruption. If you're transparent, it's much more difficult uh, to be corrupt. Also, a salary reform in the uh, public administration is absolutely important. The current system where almost everything depends on bonuses is not a good one. Everybody recognizes this. We realize that this is a very tough uh, nut to crack because salary reform in any system, in any public administration is extremely difficult. Um, because of the implications uh, to the budget, because of uh, the implications to other groups of people who then feel that, uh, admin that, that the public administration gets uh, more than they should, and so on and so forth. So it's a huge uh, general debate, uh, but you cannot flee it forever. You must have this debate at one point and go forcefully about, uh, about the salary reform, which is why we strongly support endeavors to do this and why we strongly support uh, the public administration reform. Then um, also you need a stronger focus on addressing the various enablers of corruption more effectively. And this means particularly addressing illicit financial flows, you know, supporting measures for countering tax evasion, tax avoidance schemes, use of shell companies have a much, much better um, um, uh, force in place that goes after tax um, evaders, et cetera, et cetera, because you can evade taxes and usually nothing happens. So you really need to speed up the frequency of checks uh, for uh, those people where there's a particular uh, risk and for those companies where there's a specific risk. Strengthen the civil confiscation, so non-conviction-based uh, confiscation mechanisms and also enhance the mechanisms for um, asset management, asset tracing, and uh, recovery. Then finally, it was already said, so I'll be very short, developing and strengthening more inno innovative IT tools. And I'm looking forward to the discussion with, with Mr. Fyodorov. I think uh, his ministry has done a great job already by uh, digitalizing a lot of things. In many respects, Ukraine is much, much better than uh, what we have in most of our member states. So congratulations for this. And who says digitization says transparency and who says transparency says less corruption. And then finally, also I couldn't support more what has been said already. Uh, we need to upscale the support to civil society and independent media. We've done this in the past, but it was maybe not enough. And this is also an area where we agree with the Court of Auditors that we need to do even more and both at the central and local level. That's been a long list and I'll stop here. Otherwise I will continue talking for another hour, but I'm looking forward to hearing any, any questions. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Frank and uh, uh, I had been uh, writing after you and uh, now I see that we have a long list uh, of to-dos uh, for the next five years and uh, uh, as far as I uh, 
understand one of the most important is uh, to preserve and to strengthen the institutional capacity of anti-corruption bodies which uh, uh, already exist in Ukraine to uh, launch the efficient functioning of those uh, bodies. Uh, um uh, like SAP, uh, then strengthen ARMA and uh, NAZEKA, then to look at corruption as a transsectional, uh, transministerial uh, uh, phenomena, and uh, to uh, focus our attention on anti-corruption work in the re regions. Then to keep attention on the uh, huge budget allocations which go to the, to the regions and uh, keep an eye on that uh, um, big money and how they are spent at the, at the regional level. Uh, then anti-corruption work I at the level of uh, 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 public enterprises and also the uh, anti-monopoly committee which uh, has to contribute to true market relations and become an anti-oligarch uh, tool uh, then digitalization, transparency, uh, administrative procedures. So actually this uh, shows that there are uh, a lot of uh, uh, tasks and uh, a lot of work to do. And uh, uh, this immediately brings me to the um, following questions uh, which I would very briefly ask to our speakers and ask for very brief uh, answers. How uh, agents of changes should act more efficiently to implement all those uh, tasks which were described here. Artem, what is needed for better support of the regional activists? How do you think? Thank you. I believe that there are some questions about regional organizations that are working in the anti-corruption sector. They do not have enough expertise. This is not only about regional ones. This is about those who want to become influential organizations and to carry out reforms. Often they lack experience. I will bring the example at the national level. We have ANTAC, Anti-Corruption Action Center, that monitors everything about SEPO contest. They monitored everything around NABU and the Anti-Corruption Court. And uh, I, as a consumer of this information, I was always informed about what was going on. And those stakeholders who take decisions, they also were provided with information. And uh, we had the same situation in different areas, uh, but uh, there is no proper leader, no consolidated position of civil society to provide continuous monitoring or simply speaking they do not work properly with those stakeholders who deal with changes then those processes uh, they uh, are derailed this is about uh, um, institutions where there was no proper consolidation there should be proper mentorship and cooperation Organizations should know each other and they should provide experience. How to monitor, how to inform, how to communicate. I believe that this should be a, an important component in support of civil society at the local level, especially. 
These organizations that want to position themselves, they want to demand changes for the better, they should get understanding how to do this correctly. As like in environmental sector, we want to be the source of information. Any person who wants to get information on draft law uh, 3091, for example, concerning environmental control, what is ongoing, so they can address the source of information and they may get this information there. And those stakeholders who take decision, they should have the source of information. This should be influential, proper source. That would be important for them for taking decisions. So I believe this will be a proper level of cooperation. As I understand it, this is sharing your experience and mentorship of more experienced organizations for new organizations. Uh, right, this is about advocacy. These organizations, they should know how to implement those changes and they should have this experience from more experienced organizations and about control and watchdogging. So they should provide information. They should continuously support those uh, who take decisions. I have similar question to you, Alexander, and uh, this is from the side of investigative journalists. Uh, what can strengthen the work of investigative journalists at a local level, especially at a local level? Uh, so uh, our news outlet is Nashil Grosh Lviv, but uh, we cover also for more regions uh, of the West because they do not have their own news outlet uh, for this topic. So in these regions, they have their own investigative journalists, of course, but and they should create those centers, but they lack experience how to organize them. Uh, so I like the experience of Nashi Groshi Kiev. Uh, they had such an experiment. They hired a journalist and uh, trained uh, this journalist for the work in some region. And uh, this work was really great. It was like information bomb. Uh, so we need such uh, centers for investigative journalists in uh, different regions of Ukraine. 
And uh, those uh, uh, regions that do not have such centers, they can be helped by uh, those regions who have such centers, and they may provide proper expertise how to organize the work of the center, how to carry out these investigations, how to resist attacks on journalists, and uh, they may help them in organizing all this, and I believe that we need about three years to do all this. Uh, so now one of the regions of Ukraine is trying to establish such a center of investigative journalism and uh, they uh, have many problems among them are stability, how to organize everything properly and how to find money for their activity. Uh, so this takes uh, a lot of time and uh, I would like to say that for the first uh, five years of work of our center we also had some problems with stability and other issues and our colleagues from Kiev, they great helped us in this. Uh, so we tried to help journalists and uh, we went to the regions and we provided some trainings, uh, uh, communications with journalists and uh, also workshops for them. We tried to work on a more individual uh, level, uh, but you know, it didn't produce uh, a good effect because journalists, they have a lot of activities uh, in their work. So they do their current tasks and they do not have time and resources to uh, deal with these matters and uh, after we left we haven't seen any uh, increase of these cases of these inve journalist investigations uh, so we believe that uh, uh, this work uh, uh, is um, uh, not very efficient at this level thank you thank you very much Yaroslav tell us please in your speech, you've said about involvement of international partners, that uh, you got positive experience of international experts' involvement in different processes. And about Western partners, could they be involved more in the promotion of reforms in Ukraine? Yes, there is a mechanism that is really efficient. We have seen them this mechanism in Kolomoisky case, this is pers uh, these are personal sanctions. It's not popular mechanism, and uh, 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 some people say that if we bring this mechanism, this will make like uh, make a, us look similar as an aggressive state. But uh, we believe that we should. Uh, um, provide these personal sanctions, and Artyom also clearly said that uh, um, some mechanisms, they do not work properly. That's why I believe uh, the best mechanisms, uh, these are personal sanctions. If we have proper proof of uh, corruption actions. And uh, I would like to mention one exemplary case when in 2014 Ukraine started to uh, 
provide personal sanctions against Yanukovych as a regime officials. And uh, uh, the state was not capable to form pro-parliamentation and to provide proper mechanisms. Yes, this is a tough step. And money of top officials, they are in offshore jurisdictions. And uh, from these jurisdictions, they go to wealthy Western countries. So briefly speaking, I believe this is the most efficient mechanism. Whether our partners are ready to use this mechanism, we have seen on the example of Kolomoisky that we can do this, it is efficient, and it brings proper effect. I would like to add several words. There is a wonderful mechanism of macrofinancial support that is linked to implementation of reforms. If we have positive experience of selection of officials uh, uh, with the participation of ex international experts, we may scale up this experience. Ukrainian situation shows that the leaders of newly created bodies, they identify their fate. The law may be great, but it would not be implemented if the procedure of selection of officials is not right. So I believe that we need to have these conditions spread to, to select uh, environmental inspection uh, members and state audit service members, so many new cases may be uh, created due to this. And I see that Mr. Federov came now. So uh, also you've said that uh, uh, we need to fight more with the uh, uh, money laundering. And uh, we should make our do our home task. And Yaroslav mentioned that a lot of money is going to the Western countries' jurisdictions. Uh, and uh, one of the recommendations of the audit uh, to the European Union was to develop a mechanism to prohibit uh, entry to the European Union to these oligarchs and corrupt officials. And that may be a powerful signal for them that uh, 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 they are not welcome there. The first question. Uh, to you, Frank, uh, whether the European Commission started to work in this area uh, about the visa bans. And the second question is more strategic one uh, about the agents of change, how they make operate even more in order to implement this ambitious list uh, in uh, five, not 10 or 15 years. Well, um, as regards the, the visa bans, this is, um, I'm afraid, a very tricky one because um, we are governed by the rule of law and the rule of law works both ways. Unfortunately, the rule of law also works for criminals because they have the right to defend themselves and which means that if you want to implement a visa ban, you have to have very clear proof and not just some, you know, vague allegations that uh, this person um, did things that uh, you know can lead to a visa ban and i'm afraid very often we are dependent on information given to us by for instance the prosecutor general of ukraine or other bodies in ukraine and the quality of that information and i'm not saying it's their fault it's just the the fact that it's very difficult to get the uh, quality of that information that will allow us to effectively um, have a visa ban because it doesn't make any sense to have a visa ban that will be overturned by the next judge in the European Union because there's no proof uh, that uh, would uh, justify such a visa ban. This is really the biggest problem. Uh, so again, um, the solution is to strengthening the institutions in Ukraine that are able to provide 
better quality information um, and material that allows us to um, have more of these visa beds. This being said, um, there is also on our side, uh, possibly a way to, to improve the mechanism. And indeed the European Court of Auditors um, has uh, suggested that we look into this. And this is certainly something we have committed ourselves to. So we're also looking on our side how uh, this mechanism can be improved, because indeed it would be very helpful if uh, we would have a mechanism that would ban um, people that are corrupt from traveling uh, into the European Union. And uh, that goes mostly hand in hand with them then enjoying their assets they have bought, for instance, in the south of France or somewhere else. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear colleagues, for your time. And we wish you success in implementation of these things. And I give the floor to Ms. Kaliniuk, and uh, she will be a moderator during discussion with uh, uh, Mikhail Fyodorov, uh, Vice Prime Minister. Uh, we resume our today's uh, event. I'm Daria Kalenyuk, and uh, I am from uh, I am executive director of Antark. And today we have uh, Mikhail Federer with us, uh, who is Minister of Digitalization in Ukraine. What are Ukraine's achievements in anti-corruption work during the last seven years? And um, how do you see the next seven years? And um, what are expectations from the Ministry of uh, Digitalization? Um, how can you promote this anti-corruption work? And uh, um, Mm, today, Frank Paul even uh, mentioned that Ukraine, in terms of digitalization, is uh, better than some EU countries, and that he uh, rely on your ministry in anti-corruption work. So what is your vision of these uh, things? Uh, I've been working in the ministry of uh, uh, digitalization for um, for two years now, and I feel that uh, the digitalization could be only one tool in anti-corruption work. Why only one? Because uh, the process uh, themselves uh, should be clear and understandable, and then you may go digital with those processes and. Uh, 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 digitalize the procedures. Uh, for example, today we are able to demonstrate how much uh, money could be saved by Ukrainians when they um, uh, go for some digitalized uh, services, for example, like business registration. When the service is uh, uh, digital, uh, up to 70 percent of all businesses uh, now could be registered online without actually wasting no time. In the past, if you were a resident of a small city or town, you had to go to bigger uh, center. Um, and uh, uh, they wasted time, money, and uh, uh, well, n now there's uh, uh, saved money. Uh, these are money saved by people. Uh, these are uh, 80 million of hryvnia. Although uh, before we realized that uh, the uh, corruption there was un almost unnoticeable. Uh, 
Uh, the next uh, um, is, for example, construction sector. Uh, recently, we had launched the digitalized service of informing the state that you uh, want to start some construction project, your private construction project, and uh, uh, many um, aspects of this um, registration, uh, I mean construction services now, are digitalized. Uh, starting to do that, we wasted a lot of time trying to understand where the construction register was. And we found out that the register was in private hands. It was uh, beyond the Ukrainian territory, and uh, the access to it was regulated with the login and uh, um, co uh, different codes. Uh, mm. Uh, then we had analyzed uh, that register together with uh, NABU SBU and brought it back to Ukraine. And uh, we uh, found out that there was a special script in that uh, um, uh, register. Uh, which uh, calculated carefully the bribe that had to be uh, requested when you tried to register some uh, piece of property in that register. And now we had created a new register, new big system. It uh, now uh, the construction uh, inspection is cancelled uh, uh, and thus we had subtracted that primary uh, register to re-engineering and this actually um, resulted in absolutely new services. This illustrates that uh, first you need to have a good product uh, which contains the right procedure and then this uh, internal logic of that uh, right procedure could be digitalized and uh, only in this case you um, will get uh, best results. Uh, for example, uh, uh, having analyzed that script, uh, uh, vulnerable script, which uh, um, requested bribes for um, registration of the square meters, we saved some three billion revenue. Uh, the next item is about open data. We were uh, uh, the um, among the initiators of the uh, opening of information from companies who are uh, corporate taxpayers. Uh, uh, before doing that, we had a lot of journalist investigations. Uh, now, this data will become open. This year, we, we will look at the uh, internet uh, coverage allowances, uh, that is, uh, um, uh, how uh, the national budget allocations for the co internet coverage uh, in uh, uh, scarcely populated areas uh, uh, are used and how bribes are requested by big companies. Uh, 
So doing that uh, digital service, we had to analyze the internet coverage in Ukraine, understand which areas are not covered with uh, uh, good uh, uh, internet and uh, then we produced a map and uh, found out where the uh, coverage was the poorest and uh, mm, then brought providers on the map also and this allowed uh, us to understand how to uh, how to uh, select the new service providers uh, for the uh, non-covered regions. Uh, in order to launch any project in Ukraine, you should predict where the um, uh, abuse is possible, where the misuse is possible. And uh, then you should make an anti-fraud system and prevent uh, this from happening. Uh, uh, is that true that you find uh, those uh, uh, tiny offenders who develop uh, uh, counter soft uh, uh, software um, uh, or invent the way the, the ways for frauds and uh, employ them? Yes, once that happened. Uh, so, in the result of uh, um, our uh, survey, we understood where the hidden possibilities for corruption existed and prevented this situation. In, uh, thus, we use open data in uh, internet coverage, in uh, construction, uh, or development, uh, new development registration. Mm. And uh, uh, this allows broad public to check uh, whether um, the development developers offers about new construction, whether th they are officially registered or not. Uh, governmental services actually uh, mean that the state is ready to uh, resolve the uh, issues that people have. And uh, that's why the policy which is to be implemented by the ministries has to be clear uh, by uh, sh uh, has to be clear to ordinary people. When we established our ministry, we um, uh, we, we from the very uh, uh, beginning uh, de uh, developed a good communication policy. That's why we have a public dashboard of all the projects, and this allowed us to uh, digitalize our procurements and uh, uh, like and save some six billion hryvnia on the um, public procurement. That's why uh, uh, this uh, illustrates how 
uh, these transparent instruments uh, allowed to save money for this state. This shows how much money could be retained for the budget. Actually, all the public procurement procedures, uh, um, they pass through your um, ministry. Some ministries and agencies, they try to hide their public procurement procedures, but those who are honest, uh, they... Um, uh, they communicate them to us. Uh, and uh, uh, we may prevent uh, payment for the um, uh, contracts which exceed some threshold uh, amounts. Yes, we also analyze the uh, how the uh, tenders match the criteria. And also we control the quality of public procurement procedures and then the Chamber of Accounts controls or monitors their compliance with legislation. The, one of the latest cases, subvention for the procurement of laptops. We developed uh, um, uh, the terms of reference uh, and recommended, uh, recommended terms of reference to the Ministry of Education. Uh, and uh, describe technical conditions. Uh, uh, and we based our um, tours on uh, actual criteria and uh, disseminated the um, uh, request for quotations and uh, And uh, um, uh, later on, together with SBU, we have found uh, one uh, um, a person who actually committed a fraud. Uh, he uh, persuaded um, all the participants uh, that uh, 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 they should uh, charge uh, 5,000 more per each uh, laptop. This allowed uh, perpetrators to um, get uh, 300 million additionally. And uh, together with SBU, we revealed that and uh, now the prices went down and we saved 160 million thus we managed to preserve uh, corruption to prevent corruption schemes that is if you wish to curb corruption you may succeed and digitalization may help you but in order to do this, you have to uh, design the right process. For our ministry, the ideal uh, service, this is the service without uh, uh, bureaucrats at all, fully digitalized services. Uh, from December 1st, we will launch the uh, uh, change in registration, in the place of registration, and this will be done totally automatical. Six billion is saved via the procurement tenders on hardware and software of state authority. That's impressive. Under Yanukovych uh, rule, we read a lot of uh, tenders, uh, and that was terrible. 
During the previous uh, panel, much was said about environmental issues, about uh, environmental uh, background assessment. Do you have uh, some plans related to the environment? Uh, that's true. Uh, that currently we are um, negotiating with the Ministry of Environment uh, and uh, we um, plan to launch a special project uh, where we'll do tracing of the timber uh, circulation around the country and uh, next the year we expect to get both political and operational support and also money will be allocated in the budget for these projects uh, i mean environmental projects uh, the ministry uh, chooses its focus depending on the scale of uh, services demanded. Uh, currently, we offer to administer and to request for pensions, for social payments uh, online. And uh, I believe that this news about environment will sound good for those who stand for it. You mentioned something about national budget. Do you um, uh, are you happy with the amount of money allocated for your services? Uh, mm. We had uh, build up built up our team, and we have good experts. Uh, uh, actually, we have good operational managed, management, and now we may scale up this good practice uh, uh, all over the country. And uh, um, I believe that since 2023, the budget uh, will become substantial for us. By now, we existed more as a startup. Uh, and had to prove the usefulness of our ministry and uh and uh, oh, we had uh, clearly uh, demonstrated that COVID-19 certificates might be very useful and etc. Now we may scale up all our digital projects uh, and uh, uh, later this will require more investment. One more question. I heard from our international partners. They ask you have DS, they said. You are progressive. Why it is so difficult to take decisions and there is no digitalization inside the state? In order to take a decision, one should go to different minister, ministries with paper documents. Do you have plans to improve the situation, this digitalization in state management? We should consider concrete situations. 90% uh, of all of documents are signed online using an application. I do not suffer from bureaucracy, so it can be done. A lot depends on the managers at the ministry. I believe in the Ministry of Justice, they also have this digital format. It depends on management and the culture at the level of legislation, at the level of the cabinet of ministers. Enough is done to do everything online. So some bodies, they uh, do this, some don't. So this depends on the management of these institutions. And uh, Government may also work online, and uh, this year we were living in the online format. Uh, only separate meetings were held uh, in person. So we have uh, deputies and digital transformation. They have their teams. So young specialists join. 
those new specialists. It doesn't mean that they are actually young. It means that they are new in the sector. Do you search for people to build proper team? We have great HR team. We hired 100 people in contact center to help the healthcare ministry to deal with COVID certificates issue. We have uh, DIA team and we have IT talented specialists. We involve them in the development of DIA and we try to help other ministries. A lot depends on the trust to power, the cabinet of ministers, and uh, we should provide proper compensations for people. A lot depends uh, on different factors, uh, whether you will be able to involve new specialists. There may be some mistakes in your know, horizontal interaction in your team. So this is last question from me. I know that in our country it is really difficult to plan even a year ahead, let alone five years. Let's look a year ahead. This is possible to plan. What are three main priorities in the Ministry of Digital Transformation? We have four priorities, actually. Okay. Till 2022, we would like to dig digitalize 70% uh, of the most popular services. We may provide a list of those services. This is plan 2 Gov UA. We have all plans of digital transformation there. Second, next year. We want to provide digital literacy to about 2 million Ukrainians because we should properly use different services. We should protect our personal data. We provided such education to 1 million. Next year, we would like to have 2 million. And also to provide fixed internet, 5 to 7 percent, and uh, also to provide 5 or 7 percent more of mobile internet to those settlements where they have more than 500 people. So, uh, 50, 50, uh, so we would like to improve quality in order that people be able to feel this quality of internet connection. And the city project, this is the draft law. Uh, to create the best uh, digitalized system in the world. And we hope that the uh, draft law will be adopted in the second reading and the system will be in place. Uh, and uh, we will increase the share, uh, the share of IT in our economy from 4 to 6%. So, I hope that the Minister of Justice will allow me to have some more time. If you look uh, five years ahead, uh, you know, four priorities uh, about uh, next year and what will be in Ukraine concerning digitalization till 2024, for example. Yes, uh, uh, we have plans until 2024. We believe that state services will be provided online 100%. 95% of the uh, population should have access to internet. Six million people get uh, proper literacy, IT literacy, and 10% uh, of uh, IT um, and uh, uh, in our economy, we will be better than Estonia. We are faster than New Zealand and more uh, powerful uh, in digitalization. And uh, digitalization uh, will provide more specialists, uh, twice more than now. So we will 
be living with the feeling that we achieved a big goal. So we wish uh, that your plans will come true and will be even cooler than Estonia even for uh, three years. So we wish you all the best. So we will have to... We continue our today's discussion, and now we are going to speak about the future of Ukrainian demonopolization, how to do it correctly, how to carry out this activity, and whether it is done, and what to expect from different strategies of demonopolization during the next two or five years. So we would like to thank what will happen in the nearest future. We have our guests here, uh, the Minister of Justice of Ukraine, Denis Maluska, Andrei Kvizhinsky, Head of uh, Chief Investigative Unit at the National Anti-Corruption Bureau, Anya Zagrebelska, the Trust uh, Organization, and we will be later joined by Brian Bonner, former Kiev Post Editor-in-Chief, and Akata Krilashkvili, uh, uh, chief of party at the USA Sachi program financed uh, by USA to, to fight corruption in Ukraine. And now we're going to speak about fight against the oligarchs before we were speaking about fighting corruption and uh, can we separate with these issues uh, i believe that uh, they are interrelated but we will try to divide these issues and discuss them separately i would like to give the floor first to denis maluska tell us please denis you developed the draft law on oligarchs and now this is a law it entered into force what are the uh, expectations concerning this draft uh, concerning this law for the next year let's imagine that we are um, now having the meeting 
uh, next year, the same day. So first, uh, I would like to thank you for your question. I'm not the author of the law. But we have several authors, and the key author is the president himself. This is not an exaggeration. This is not like Brezhnev is everywhere. The key author and the bearer of the main ideas of this law is the president. This is for the first time the president was so involved in the development of the draft law. About some ideal goals that may be reached in a year. They were repeatedly declared. Uh, we do not have oligarchs in Ukraine. We have big business that uh, do not interfere in uh, politics and do not earn on state budget. So this is the aim of maybe any anti-monopoly legislation. So the monopoly, if it exists, it should not abuse uh, the law. And uh, the aim of this law is not to make rich poor or to take control over some flows of money or to replace oligarchs, but to create conditions for oligarchs in order that they won't be able to influence politics to get profit. So this is the law on oligarchs and uh, Ukrainian oligarchs differ from foreign oligarchs. They do not sign documents, they do not take any official decisions, and the law enforcement system cannot deal with them properly. They cannot carry out some investigative activities. They are under shield and uh, they have offshore shell companies to protect themselves. So this is the law on oligarchs. This is the first law that provides incentives to get rid of this oligarch status. It creates some risks for the status quo of oligarchs in the country. So this is the main idea of the law. And uh, this is one of not many laws that have the article concerning this law in Wikipedia. So this information is available to the public. Uh, so oligarchs, they believe they are big business. And what about the number of the oligarchs? How many of them do we have? Maybe drug uh, barons also believe they are big business. I do not know how many oligarchs we have. Uh, we have mechanisms for this that are envisaged by law. This term, oligarch, is not a street term now. This is not some part of political demagogy. It uh, is the legal term. And I, as a Minister of Justice, I would like to provide a, a definition, legal definition. So an oligarch is a person who will be in the register of oligarchs starting my, um, uh, my next year. So in a year. We will have clear understanding. On the 7th of May, this law will be put into action, so there will be mechanisms in place concerning decision taking, and we will have first results, uh, first uh, register, first list uh, at the end of May. If everything goes in accordance with the plan, we won't introduce changes to the law. I would like to remind you that in December, there will be decision of the Venice Commission on this law, and uh, evidently there will be some filing of cases to constitutional court. Uh, they will try to block the implementation of this law. So 
we have our plans and we will see what will be next. Now we go to the so uh, Mr. Minister provided information about law enforcement bodies that it is difficult to deal with oligarchs whether it is the case and is it possible whether law enforcement bodies be able to bring oligarchs to responsibility or to somehow harm their illegal activities or whether they carry out some illegal activities. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much for your question. This is the case. Persons who may be considered oligarchs, they are well protected by different means, starting from physical ones, technical ones, legal ones, and uh, it's evident that all the cases, all proceedings concerning oligarchs, they are really difficult concerning investigation of these cases because they are really complicated, multi-stage actions are taken that bring criminal results and a lot of people are involved. There are connections in power and they counteract actively this investigation and I would like to say that NABU as a body is dealing with cases that are connected with the persons that may be identified as oligarchs or those who protect their interests and we deal with these cases for a long time and uh, there are cases, uh, the case, one of the first resonance case that was brought to court. This is the case of director of uh, the Parisia at uh, the Magnium uh, plant and also private bank case that we investigate. Also resonance case is Rotterdam Plus case. Also, the case of uh, Samara uh, Western Direction. Uh, sorry, I will interrupt you. So, Firtash case and the uh, private bank. This is Kalamoyski case, uh, Samara case, pipeline. This is Medvedchuk. What else? Rotterdam plus this is Akhmetov. And we may also remember the cases concerning Bogdan Automobile Corporation. This is Petro Poroshenko. So I believe that the majority of persons who may be considered oligarchs, they are covered by our work. This work is done on a continuous basis. The number of cases that I've mentioned, they are considered in courts and also charges were given and the cases now are moving forward and uh, it's not easy to speak about the role in these cases uh, uh, of these oligarchs but if we reveal that some corrupt actions were made to uh, uh, reach their goals to uh, provide for their interests. We do everything possible in order to bring those uh, involved to criminal responsibility. Uh, this is not only about criminal responsibility for people, but uh, you may also arrest or uh, confiscate some assets. Of course, in all the cases where we identified losses, we arrest the property in accordance with the Constitutional Court decision. We also could file the cases concerning the uh, contracts to, um, but we were deprived of this right about confiscation. It is possible only uh, by the decision of the court and uh, 
uh, we want to arrest the property in order not to lose it. And we hope that based on the uh, court hearings, this uh, asset will be confiscated to the benefit of the state. But this pipeline was arrested and now it is um, managed by the state. It is under the agency of asset management and it provided to Ukrtrans Nafta Enterprise. This is a real result of the work. Thank you, Andrei. Uh, and uh, we've mentioned Rotterdam Plus case. This is a NABU case. And in this case, Liga Antitrust is involved and uh, Anti-Corruption Action Center is also trying to uh, help in this case to bring this case to court to be heard. And uh, uh, Mr. Minister said about anti-monopoly committee and uh, he only remembered it, but uh, Everyone speaks about anti-monopoly uh, committee. What should be the role of this body? Does it implement its functions concerning the ol oligarchization? And what should be improved in this work? Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Politiki understood clearly uh, that uh, big business uh, uh, pays taxes, big business provides jobs, uh, uh, develops the regions, and uh, actually big business uh, uh, is able to make pressure on politics. And that's why the role of governmental agencies um, is uh, to uh, make this uh, uh, division between uh, big business and uh, uh, the uh, governance in, in, in politics in any country um, and uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, competition bodies like anti-monopoly committee in the developed countries they play big role they have good experts uh, in different sectors uh, they have uh, um, good managers and uh, uh, on the other and they set uh, clear rules of the game. Uh, on the other hand, they are subject to uh, uh, strict selection. They are uh, selected for um, limited uh, term in office, and uh, uh, they are subject uh, to very strict uh, rules, uh, both for appointment and uh, dismissal. Uh, in many aspects, Ukraine is uh, different uh, from developed countries because uh, we have young market economy uh, and the anti monopoly committee uh, started to, to develop only 28 years ago. And uh, even now, many politicians politicians and the public at large do not clearly understand what is the um, public role of the anti-monopoly committee, but this role is quite clearly understood by the uh, big businesses and uh, 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 due to this understanding, they un uh, try to create very special conditions for the anti-monopoly committee, because otherwise it has to be a high barrier for the uh, monopolist development in Ukraine. Uh, the, uh, uh, we saw a long story how the leadership of the 
in the monopoly committee first had to be uh, appointed by the parliament, then by the president, uh, uh, then um, uh, how the uh, notion of the criminal offense, uh, inter-monopoly criminal offense was uh, uh, Hmm, determined in legislation, etc. So as of today, we do not have so uh, uh, many uh, inter-monopoly committee members who would uh, stay in office for the whole term. And uh, uh, quite... Uh, if you, uh, I, uh, I'm, uh, see decisions are uh, sued to court, and mm, uh, I cannot recollect any political leader who would. Uh, uh, recognize that the reason of uh, um, weak Ukrainian economy and high level of uh, monopolization in, in it is the weak anti-monopoly committee. Thus, our politicians have to recognize that uh, pursuing anti um, oligarchization and intermonopolization, we should strengthen the Anti-Monopoly Committee. The uh, name of the uh, AMC chairman should become uh, of primarily importance for us. Uh, we uh, should require that uh, AMC uh, chairman, uh, chairpersons should be appointed after careful scrutiny and uh, that uh, um, the employees of that uh, body should be um, also subject of uh, public attention. I may recollect to you the scandal uh, with anti-monopoly committee in the United States and the scandal with E.O.N. in Germany, where Chancellor Merkel had to interfere. Uh, uh, this both in both uh, scandals where. Uh, the regulators, that is, anti-monopoly committees in the United States and in Germany, um, uh, they preserved their decisions and the chairpersons of the bodies remained in office. We have to strengthen the powers of the committee. We have to strengthen its activity. We have to allocate more money for OMC because they drastically lack money for expertise. Uh, we should involve more consumers to OMC. We have to create a separate court chamber who would review the MC chambers, but all that improvements uh, um, would uh, uh, change the situation without uh, um, change of overall political approach to the AMC. In, in order to have a powerful AMC, we have to ensure its independence from politicians. Not because politicians are corrupt, but because they um, uh, interact with big, big businesses and they have quite different objectives than AMC. Uh, uh, we have to prevent creation of huge market uh, uh, giants, that is, companies having a big market share. That is it in brief. Uh, thank you.
uh, you uh, pointed out uh, the to the main um, uh, points of tension. You mentioned about courts uh, and uh, uh, that uh, AMC decisions were sued to court and uh, that decisions were repealed, actually. Uh, we, we, having created a strong AMC, may we expect that its decisions uh, would uh, uh, become irrevocable in courts. Uh, as of uh, today, we should uh, say that uh, AMC decisions are being repealed uh, in courts due to the mistakes made by AMC itself. The second is that all the courts, uh, they do not exist in vacuum. They rely on the general um, uh, reputation of the Buddhists. That is, if uh, AMC becomes uh, strong, its decisions uh, um, may become more uh, well-grounded and m more reputable, so to say. We also have to create special chambers and courts dealing with the uh, AMC cases. Why we need them? Because they have to take into account huge uh, um, bulk of economic information, while ordinary judges are not uh, able to, um, to do this. That is, we have to produce specialized judges in anti-monopoly cases, and uh, uh, they should have a very specific approach to, to these economic cases. Later, we will invite the minister to um, refer um, and provide feedback about the idea of special anti-monopoly courts. Now, I would like to invite Eka Tkeshalashvili, Chief of Party at the USAID Sachi Program. This is an anti corruption project from USAID. Uh, and uh, before that, Eka was a chairperson in the uh, uh, European anti-corruption initiative. Uh, now my question to you, Eka. Today we mentioned the chamb the audit the, or the opinion from the European Chamber of Accounts, which emphasized the need for European uh, support to Ukraine. And in that. Uh, report in that review much was said about the oligarchs and uh, um, that body that European body expressed uh, its dissatisfaction with the level of support from the European Union to Ukraine in its uh, uh, anti-oligarchs work uh, and uh, I would uh, uh, ask you to uh, to speak more about the oligarchization uh, and uh, uh, where does the counteraction to corruption become the counteraction to oligarchs so my question to you uh, uh, to uh, review that uh, uh, audit or um, report uh, uh, and uh, to suggest what international partners could offer to Ukraine in the support of the anti-oligarch and anti-corruption work. Thank you. Thank you, Daria. Uh, hello to everyone for, from the beautiful city of Jerusalem. We have been here attending today uh, a, a conference related to uh, 
innovation and technologies and how that could help uh, improvement of life for, for citizens, communities, including for better governance and then curbing corruption. And I just wanted to mention that uh, for one reason, that I'm very pleased that Ukraine is very much in sync with major trends of development at the global scale. So all the issues that have been discussed today at your event and generally the major trends in which Ukraine is engaged in, including in the field of digitalization, fight against corruption, striking the balance between efficiency and all the rights and freedoms that have to be engaged, something that is very important for Ukraine, but is not unique when it comes to that to Ukraine as well. It's part of where the world is moving and uh, it's part of challenges and opportunities that uh, so many communities around the globe are um, engaged with and are facing. Now, when it comes to this particular question, I guess, uh, part of uh, what um, is not frequently mentioned when we speak about the oligarchization is the core of the importance of that process from the point of view of a citizen, of an individual and members of the communities. It's not uh, something that uh, it needs to be looked primarily through the lens of the international community or through the lens of government or even more so through the lens of uh, who potentially could be themselves uh, defined as uh, oligarchs, but how citizens of Ukraine and public of Ukraine looks into that and how they understand that it's not only an issue that relates to uh, moral underpinnings of the free societies in a democracy and is a top priority in so many ways when it comes to a fight against corruption for the society in Ukraine, but the tangible effect of success of this fight that it might can have for every everybody in Ukraine, especially for those who are disadvantaged the most when it comes to the level of life, economic potential, and realization of those potential currently in Ukraine. Uh, in other words, if Ukraine, and I'm convinced that Ukraine will be uh, successful in this direction, will be successful in bringing uh, up the system that is fair and just and provides a level play field for all, irrespective of who you are as an individual or how big you are as a business and how influential you could be on the market or on the political life in conjunction to that, uh, in, in, in Ukraine, you have the same rules that I apply to everybody, that market is competitive, it's open, and it provides ground for creativity and opportunity for people to thrive. And when it comes to the basic services that need to be provided for realization of basic rights, when it comes to you know electricity, heating systems, normalcy of the social life, when it comes to how we all would see in the, the, the developed, uh, not only developed, but developing countries on the trajectory of good development should be, how that is affected with the way if markets, if the rule-based societies are distorted or not in the way how rules are operating, whether or not anybody has a special status in a country and how that could be changed. In other words, a bit of demystification of the oligarchization, the oligarchization of Ukraine, I think, is needed so that we break it down to different clusters and building blocks of what that pathway of Ukraine means for the country, for the government, for the society and individuals. And when you look at that from that perspective, you understand how complex this process is, but you understand that it's doable as well at the same time, so that if the plan is combined with the commitment of the government and the commitment of the society to be resilient and persistent in this direction, then there are all grounds to believe that one can be successful into that. You ask me about um, uh, what international community could do more for that fight to be successful and whether or not it was sufficient. Uh, I can tell with full confidence that uh, European Union, and I can say with com full confidence that the United States government have full commitment to help Ukraine uh, to be successful in this fight and to provide all it takes as much as Ukraine asks for that assistance. I'm not here speaking on behalf of any of the governments or organizations, but I'm, I'm in the shoes of an implementer, so to say, who is tasked to do that job and who is tasked to provide that assistance. And this commitment is there. So more clarity is from the Ukrainian side as well, how fight can go in this direction, 
more assistance is provided, and then more assistance is successful in this direction. We talked about uh, competitiveness of the markets, which is extremely important. There was a lot that has been mentioned on the Public Committee, and I will not repeat that, but there are very important elements into the plan that government recently flew, approved as a continuation of adoption of this law. And here we, we, we have very important directions in which further action needs to be done for that fight to be a meaningful uh, one that could actually deliver. And the different sectors of the economy I identified, energy, for example, media sector, uh, in terms of ensuring uh, freedoms uh, and then independence of uh, media, but then in, in anti-corruption fields that are, can be branded anti-corruption per se in this direction, we, we can name a lot of initiatives, including with uh, initiative of the related to the political lobbies, related uh, to political finance and transparency of that, resilience and strength and independence of anti-corruption framework. And I would want to add that when it comes to the guiding principles that relates to how anti-corruption measures can amplify reforms in the sectors that can promote openness of the markets and level play field of the market, then the anti-corruption strategy that is uh, awaiting for consideration and adoption of the parliament with the second hearing provides very good uh, guidance and concrete commitments that could certainly not only contribute, but then could uh, ensure that the anti-corruption reforms uh, actually serve that purpose of amplifying and ensuring that all the sectoral reforms are successful and they are based on the principles of transparency and accountability and with that provide more efficiency and effectiveness of how they could deliver in shorter period of time rather than only in the long term at the end of the day. And final word, I would say that at times it is taken for granted that in Ukraine civil society is very strong, very vibrant, as if, you know, you guys can do your job and then nothing more is needed to help and support you. Uh, I don't disagree with the fact that uh, civil society is very vibrant and very capable in, in, in Ukraine, and you are great examples of that. But sustainability of that action is very important so that you continue to do the job that you have excelled uh, doing in Ukraine and uh, in that sense provide constant watchdogging, uh, constant help and guidance uh, when it is um, accepted and well absorbed by the governmental institutions and ensure that in that sense, civil society serves the purpose for what it is known for in democracies and has the capacities to do so. Thank you, Eka. Uh, thank you for, for your remarks. We'll uh, return back to you. I just want to continue with our panel, uh, uh, which is in person. Uh, uh, пане міністре, uh, знову повернемося uh, до вас. Uh, 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 minister, uh, there was much expectation from the law uh, against oligarchs. You mentioned that the president was a driver of this law, and you discussed this law from many aspects. Uh, 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 did you discuss uh, the role of the uh, Inter-Monopoly Committee in the oligarchization process? Because uh, from Agia's uh, presentation, I understood that AMC is able uh, to act even today. Thank you for your question. We've discussed all this. I would like to say that uh, there was a big media campaign against this law to block it, to block its implementation. Uh, so they said that the power do not pay attention to classic means of fighting oligarchs, but this is not the case. So there is some criticism now, but uh, Systemically, we started fighting oligarchs a um, long time ago. The law concerning Kolomoisky was uh, adopted and it created more than majority in the parliament and also uh, in the parliament a draft was registered and it will become the law uh, against uh, 
let's say so against Surkes and uh, and uh, this is about 10 billion private bank money that were taken out and also the this law is like the cherry on the cake. Also about the anti monopoly committee last Wednesday, the government adopted measures concerning the oligarchization, the key element of which is the increase of capabilities of anti monopoly committee. In the parliament, they registered two draft laws that regulate this issue, and we understand the importance of anti monopoly committee in this fight against uh, oligarchs and their abuse. There are a lot of means uh, concerning improvement of financing and uh, independence of anti-monopoly committee. For a long time, we have been thinking to introduce a separate chamber or a court that would consider important cases, uh, financial cases, anti-monopoly cases, where there is concentrated interests of oligarchs. And uh, in the sphere where the Ministry of Justice works, where we work as a regulator and we use different administrative sanctions, the problem is that the majority of grave violations of law is done not because of lack of qualification, but because people want to do something corrupt. Those who violate the law, they clearly understand that they violate it. So this qualification is important, but uh, what is the difference between the measures uh, that were provided by the Cabinet of Ministers' decision? Each measure has long time for implementation. And uh, the main or the only criteria is of truth is practice, as philosophers say. So whether it is anti kalamoisky or other laws or reforms, we will see this reaction. And uh, uh, this law on oligarchs, this is the biggest hit on the status quo in the Ukrainian politics and economy. And we will increase the role of anti-monopoly committee and uh, of uh, other regulators uh, on energy, regulator on communication, and uh, uh, other regulators. And also the courts, the court should be more independent, more capable, more independent. And the expertise was also mentioned that anti-monopoly committee, they need this uh, money for uh, court expertise. And um, the capabilities of uh, these uh, specialists, these experts should be increased. And uh, we see a big picture. We have some po complex measures. We may move forward step by step, and it will take years. And there are mechanisms that are more quick. But anti-monopoly committee is a big priority. And uh, The anti monopoly committee provided for uh, reform, and we will support the idea of uh, enforcement of uh, mm, uh, the role of uh, um, anti monopoly committee. Now, question to argue whether this plan of actions of the government will strengthen anti monopoly committee, will it help to fight? Uh, oligarchs and what the, the draft laws mentioned by the minister uh, will help in the reform of anti-monopoly committee. Unfortunately, draft laws on anti-monopoly, uh, they are rather raw. The selection procedure 
remains the same and the procedure of uh, hiring and firing of these uh, officials. Uh, this should provide uh, uh, for uh, so this procedure remains non-transparent and um, the grounds for firing remains the same and uh, it allows to fire uh, these members of the committee uh, because of some subjective uh, uh, decisions and there were some cases of this and those changes that uh, are proposed uh, they do not touch these topics also the anti-monopoly committee depends on the politicians and the head of the anti-monopoly committee uh, the salary will depend uh, on the assessment of the cabinet of ministers and also there is a dependence of anti-monopoly committee on politicians on the budget committee and on the government that we have at the moment and uh, also anti-monopoly committee is more separated from the public because those interests uh, that uh, our citizens have to participate in the monopoly committee concerning compensation, uh, participation in anti-monopoly processes. And when we separate uh, the committee more from society, the society will pay less attention to the committee. The society won't feel the results of the work of anti-monopoly committee. And uh, there will be less defenders in society concerning the monopoly committee and there will be less publicity so we see more negative aspects than positive aspects in this and if we recall the uh, memorandum of the um, imf and the newest uh, uh, memorandum and uh, those drafts uh, they implement only one uh, recommendation uh, concerning decisions of anti-monopoly committee. Other recommendations uh, concerning hiring and firing and reinforcement of re uh, responsibilities of anti-monopoly committee, they are not met. Can we somehow amend these uh, draft laws? Yes, we may do it before the second reading. And uh, the deputies provided amendments to this draft. Uh, and this is the precedent when hundreds of amendments uh, were submitted. And 90% of them, this is not uh, drafts, uh, not uh, spam. These are real amendments to this draft law. I would like to say that uh, monopoly in energy sphere is a popular topic now. And each uh, objects uh, uh, of energy were bought uh, with the decision of uh, anti-monopoly committee. So they were not bought without. So the last uh, permission was provided in 2021. Two permissions were provided. Uh, these are uh, previous were done in 2020 and before this, and now we have new transactions. We consider them in the committee. Uh, they are the first people in uh, um, Forbes list. So the role of the um, anti-monopoly committee is really important in this process. So energy monopoly, uh, this is Renata Khmetov, and he controls uh, uh, um, coal industry and uh, uh, electrical power plants. They were um, privatized by him with the permission of anti-monopoly committee. We have all copies of the decisions and we have all decisions of the anti-monopoly committee and uh, um, 
starting the second president of Ukraine and uh, 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 concerning all the decisions. We have didn't have any bans uh, uh, and, uh, uh, in times of fifth president and sixth president. Uh, there were some bans when uh, there were some people uh, uh, who were under sanctions. Then we banned some transactions. But uh, in other transactions, we provided permission. Uh, so when we speak about independence of anti-monopoly committee, and there should be proper guarantees of independence, um, do you work in anti-corruption agency? And uh, these guarantees were provided, and uh, we may compare these guarantees. Uh, do they help? I mean, these guarantees, what are the main guarantees? What are more important, what are less important? Thank you for your question. Yes, I believe that they really help, they really protect us. Maybe you remember about the number of attempts to fire the head of the bureau, and uh, in the result, they were not successful. And uh, this is due to the mechanisms provided by the law, these guarantees uh, that prevented this biased uh, uh, attempt of uh, uh, firing. So these guarantees are really important. They provide the opportunity to do your work independently from interference of others. And uh, maybe you know that we have a delayed process of selection of the head of specialized prosecutor's office. And this demonstrates that in this case, the guarantees are not enough and mechanisms are not really good. And for a year, we are working with prosecutor's office without the head of this agency. So the guarantees in SAPO are not properly adhered to, and we are waiting till the end of this contest in order to have this head of this institution in place. One more question to you. Uh, so if we are thinking about uh, five years ahead, so what should be the strategy of Ukraine in fighting oligarchs? You are a person who is working in a National Anti-Corruption Bureau. What are three priorities for Ukraine, what should be done in order to have real demonopolization and de-oligarchization in Ukraine. I think this is my subjective view as a worker in this body. I would like to say that we should provide guarantees of independence and the institutional capability of NABU, SAPO, and High Anti-Corruption Court. Also, I believe that we should complete the reform of the courts. We face this situation regularly. Interested parties use courts and they try to illegally interfere in our activity in the investigation of the cases. And uh, the state regulators, they also should have uh, plus minus the same guarantees of independence that would provide them opportunity to carry out their functions appropriately. Thank you. I have a question to Eka. Please, are you with us? Please. Uh, Brian Bourne was not able to join us, uh, and in this uh, law, we should not forget about the media. Okay, you were speaking a lot about necessity 
to have this request of citizens for change, that citizens should understand what oligarchization means. And uh, our citizens, they usually consume information from the sources that belong to oligarchs. We are speaking about national television. The biggest media in Ukraine belong to oligarchs, and they often use them in order to increase their influence or to decrease the influence of some politicians. If you're speaking about um, international partners, how can the uh, projects of international assistance uh, provide for uh, independence of the media and to increase the number of journalist investigations? I know that the European Anti-Corruption Initiative supported investigative journalists, and uh, uh, during previous panel we heard that in the regions there are not many investigative journalists. Uh, workshops and trainings do not work. And uh, it is difficult to provide these independent media outlets uh, in the regions. It takes a lot of time. Nashi Groshi Lviv News Outlet, they said that it takes a long time, about three years, to establish such centers in the region. So how can we stimulate these uh, media in the regions to uh, provide for this uh, issue concerning oligarchs and how to deal with them? I think in response to your question, um, to begin with, uh, I would mention that when we talk about raising public awareness and with that, they support to sometimes painful reforms that have to be undertaken, is that it needs to be very creative and multifaceted. It needs to be a combination of both positive stories that are well resonating with the people so that they understand that the change is possible in the country and it is being delivered. And it needs to be uh, having a critical element of it as well so that all that needs to be changed even more uh, and is not changed yet uh, is put on light so that there is an understanding of what needs to be changed uh, more. But beyond that, when we talk about uh, you know, oligarchic influences in the country and impact of that on economy, on everyday life of the citizens, that needs to break down in a simplistic way to the people. And by simplistic, I mean in a positive way. ABCs of what it means for everyday life of a human being living in that condition. So if you pay for your electricity, if you pay for your hearing systems, if your child goes to the school or university, how all of that is affected and for an elder in terms of right to have, not the right, but possibility of uh, having a free space for entrepreneurial activities without overshadowing of the big guys. What, what is the impact of all of that that needs to be part of that process that will deliver better life in this regard? And I agree that investigative journalism is, is, is a very significant component of that. And it's particularly important to uh, see how synergy between uh, journalists, NGOs, uh, and experts in the fields could deliver that a national and local level. And I would say that, uh, echoing to what you said, that platforms where the content could be put from journalists, it's not that easy to obtain in the regions. So that synergy and collaboration could be one way of going forward with ensuring that it's not just the capacity development of the local journalists in different constituencies, small villages, big villages, cities, but then platforms where the content could be amplified that will be needed. And for that, obviously, assistance of international partners has been delivered, but then needs to be delivered even more in this direction. And I have to say that investigative journalism-related activities and support to the media per se, media actors, and not only NGOs, uh, has, has been a big priority uh, for, for the U.S. government throughout the years and will continue to be so as long as this need uh, it maintains to be the need in the country. But I have to emphasize that we have that responsibility, and by we, we I mean all of us in that ecosystem of reform promoters, I would say, to see how more creatively we can bring that content to an individual, to the societies in Ukraine in such a way, in different communities, that when we talk about anti-corruption measures, when we talk about anti-oligarchic law as a framework law that needs to 
unroll myriad of other measures to actually deliver the result that brings that level play field in politics, social life, media life, or in economy, then, then that's what it means for them. Now, in the midterm and in the long term, and it needs to be broken down in short narratives, easily understandable narratives that resonate with their everyday life. And by saying that, I want to emphasize that I don't say that because Ukrainian society doesn't care about strategic issues, about strategic direction of Ukraine's development. We've seen time and again how far Ukrainian society can go in being commitment, committed for that strategic change and trajectory of development uh, of Ukraine. But at the end of the day, we all fight our fights in everyday life as well. And the same goes for ordinary families in Ukraine. And they need to see and comprehend in easily developed stories, narratives, content that when we talk about an initiative in any given field, this is what it actually means for you, for your everyday life, for your family. And I believe that that's part of this novel element of communication that we need to have in mind, apart from what we consider to be classics in terms of public awareness campaigns that be or investigative journalism in that regard. Thank you, Eka. Дякую, Eka. Я думаю, що це продовження вашого вислову демистифікація. Uh, I like uh, demystification and deoligarchization. Uh, deoligarchization should be properly explained to people or based on the everyday um, things, uh, not just remotely. Uh, we still have several minutes left, and uh, I would request you to uh, express just a couple of words, and then we will uh, wrap up. Uh -huh. I'm not guilty. <laughs> Was it a confession to Nabu? What would you say to Nabu? Um, uh, actually, I don't think I can uh, summarize it all in a couple of words. What I would like to do, I would like to wish us all to work together. Mm. I believe that oligarchs are able to uh, capitalize on our ability uh, or our, on our disability to get united and uh, on our weaknesses. And uh, I would encourage everybody to become stronger and to get united. Uh, uh, super, thank you. I believe that many experts from the NGO would uh, agree with you. Mm, Andri. Uh, in Nabo, we clearly understand uh, how strong, uh, how strongly the oligarch's impact uh, hampers Ukrainian development and how it uh, prevents uh, the rule of law in Ukraine. That's why we are keen to um, to work hard uh, within the scope of our mandate and uh, to cope with that excessive influence. Uh, um, very soon, the new Nabu director will will start again. Uh, uh, I believe that I have to speak on behalf of the NGO sector. We are um, the most interested in the oligarchization. Perhaps uh, we are not able to formulate this uh, in proper language uh, formulas, but we clearly understand that the end uh, payer for the corruption is an ordinary Ukrainian citizen. That's why we are the most motivated to tackle um, corruption and to uh, uh, 
implement de-oligarchization. That's why uh, I encourage you to involve uh, more people and to use uh, this uh, tool of uh, uh, collective uh, filing to court. I believe that Ukrainian people know their rights and can become a partner of the state in anti-oligarch work ECA. The floor is yours. Uh, I'll end with a, a little bit of a joke, perhaps, but I, I think it was Charles Dickens, if I'm not mistaken, who said once that they didn't know that it was impossible, so they did it. Uh, I'm not saying that it's impossible, but this comes with this inherent enthusiasm and uh, commitment that you don't take anything as a no, as an answer, then you don't take anything as impossibility in any, any difficult situation. And this is something that is a very strong character, I believe, of Ukrainian society to which then then go through all the difficulties uh, in history and now as well, and to come out of it even stronger than before. And I think that this is the time for us all to believe that this is what is the core when it comes to going through that difficult process, because at the end of the day, we're not talking about surviving, we're talking about thriving as a future for Ukraine. And that only can be achieved if that enthusiasm, even sometimes naivete, but strong commitment and enthusiasm of say, taking everything as a possible rather than impossible is something that is needed. It's not very technical expert description that I gave you at the end of the day, but I think this is something that sometimes is overlooked and it's quite a bit needed when it comes to self-assurance of for the future. Дякую, Еко. Дякую панелістам всім на цьому. Thank you to all the panelists. Let's uh, um, uh, wrap up now. I would like to summarize just in few words. Um, now, uh, eight years of uh, seven years after the revolution of dignity. We understood that our um, theory of change uh, had worked, and uh, we have created uh, a NABU uh, SAP uh, anti corruption court and understood that the um, uh, main procedure is uh, sele uh, main procedure is a selection procedure. Very soon we will launch the uh, judiciary reform, where uh, again selection process uh, will be monitored uh, by proper watchdogs. Now we have clear markers for the movement forward. I hope that in eight years from today uh, we will there will be no need to um, assist neither nabu nor uh, um, uh, uh, SAP and uh, that anti-monopoly uh, committee decisions won't be sued to court and uh, um, we believe that uh, in future anti-monopoly committee will become strong, its leadership will be strong and uh, the uh, uh, chairperson of the anti-monopoly committee will be well known as the national here, uh, hero even to the school children and uh, that we will have no more oligarchs uh, who would will become just big or small businesses or middle-sized businesses, but not oligarchs. That in seven, eight years, uh, mass media will become truly independent and uh, people would not be tortured with the propaganda while uh, people would be able to defend uh, their interests and course and uh, uh, keeping in mind what uh, Minister of Digitalization said, that we, will, we are dreaming that we will become even more digitalized than Estonia. Thank you.